you're online at the Feel Good Station. Your first stop for feel good music, feel good chat, and much, much more. The Cellar of Horrors. Welcome to yet another edition of the Cellar of Horrors on the Feel Good Station. I'm your host, Tim Mendes, joined as ever by my little spidery sidekick, Septimus. <coughs> and yeah, we've got another fun-filled and exciting episode, as you come to expect. The track you heard to lead us in there was an absolute favourite of mine, uh, and uh, a favourite of my partner's, that's why I've kind of had to play it. <laughs> That was the Screaming Banshee Aircrew with Peachy Clean from their 2007 album When All Is Said and Done. And my first guest of today is Ed Chuke, also known as Mr. Ed, who was the frontman of the Screaming Banshee Aircrew. Now, he's now in the band The Insect and has previously also been in Partly Faithful. But my partner's absolute favourite is Screaming Banshee Aircrew. So yeah, basically if I didn't play it, I'd be in trouble. (laughs) 
That will be coming up a little bit later in the first hour. In the second hour, we'll be joined by Australian author Neen Cohen to talk about her new release and a previous release and various other bits and pieces. We'll also be playing the usual selection of tunes, old and new. Hang on, hang on a minute. This is getting quite distracting. What are you doing? What are you doing? I can just hear scribbling. Oh, God. It's December, so he's writing his Christmas list. Oh, God. It's all going to be things that I can't afford. I know it is. <laughs> it's like he's already out badgering me for an Xbox X and a PS5. To be fair, I want them as well, but <laughs> they're really expensive still. You know, I even checked out like Black Friday and Cyber Monday, and they're still really, really expensive, like way out of my price range at the moment. <laughs> anyway, Septimus, don't you have to be good to get presents at Christmas? <laughs> now that's people's Christmas. So Santa has different rules for spiders. <laughs> you don't send letters to Santa. Well, who do you send letters to then? <laughs> Atlaknaka. Isn't Atlaknaka one of the great old ones? <laughs> oh, dearie, dearie me. So you don't have to be good. Is there any sort of prerequisite to receiving gifts from Atlaknaka? <laughs> A sacrifice. Hang, hang on a minute. Are you planning on offering me as a sacrifice to the spinner in the vault, you daft spider? <coughs> oh, quickly moving on, then. <laughs> because I probably don't have much time left. <laughs> Let's have your Septimus's synth selection for this week, then. What have you got for us this week, Septimus? Ooh, oh, a deep cut there. That's a good one. Yeah, great band. Very overlooked, very underappreciated, in my opinion. A great band. Portion Control. They were a superb sort of synth industrial band of the 80s. And Septimus has chosen the track Brain Scraper Death Dive from the 1986 album Psycho Bod Saves the Universe. Try saying that when you've had a couple. Yeah, they're a brilliant band. I, I managed to catch them at the Infest Festival like back in 2006, I believe it was. And yeah, they were really good. They were really good. Really, really fun. So here we go. This is Brain Scraper Death Dive by Portion Control. Yeah. Right, right, but die. 
You're online at the Feel Good Station. Truth is only a shade of me For all you 
couple of great tracks there back to back. The first one you heard was Septimus's synth selection for this week, Brain Scraper Death Dive by Porsche Control from their 1986 album Psychobod Saves the World. Following that, you had a song by All Hallows Eve. The song was also called All Hallows Eve, and that song featured Tim Chandler from Manuscript, Pretentious Moi, Sins of the Flesh on vocals. All Hallows Eve were one of those bands. There was quite a few of them a, a while ago. They were sort of like super groups set up by members of other of established bands, and they had like a revolving door of people coming in and guest vocalists and things like this. Most famously was Mark Thwaite from the Missions MGT project, which was absolutely superb, and I'll get some on the show at some point. Now, that one was started by... Thomas O'Connell from Garden of Delight and featured the aforementioned Mr. Chandler and Rachel Spate from Die Laughing, amongst others. It's a great, great project. They were only around a very short time. They did one album and one EP. That song was taken from the 2014 album The Dreaming, and it's well worth checking out. It's a great little album. It's very little known, I think. And it should be known more because it's really good. There's some damn fine tunes on there, that one being one of them. Okay, as we've just mentioned Die Laughing, I think I'm uh, I'm going to go with that next. I think I'm, I'm going to go down that rabbit hole and uh, bang on a Die Laughing track. So yeah, here we go. This is Glamour and Suicide by Die Laughing. <laughs> Shade 
Feel Good Station, taking you to the best shows.
You're listening to the Cellar of Horrors on the Feel Good Station. Two criminally overlooked bands there, both from the 90s. The first one was Die Laughing with their song Glamour and Suicide from 1995. And that was followed by The Mist of Avalon with Sleepless from 1998. The Mr. of Avalon especially, like I don't think many people outside of their native Sweden know of them. And they should, because they're a great little band. Yeah, they reformed like in the early 2010s. I don't know what they're doing now. I don't, I've not seen any activity from them for a long time. But, you know, fingers crossed that they'll come over here on a tour at some point. <laughs> you know, they all seem to come out of the woodwork sooner or later. Right, we get to that point now where we're going to be joined by our first guest of the evening, Mr. Ed Chuk, or Mr. Ed, from the band The Insect. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go and deal with an arachnid, <laughs> from an insect to an arachnid. I'm going to go and deal with Septimus, get him sorted. So what I'm going to do, being as Ed has also been in Banshee Air Crew and Partly Faithful, and I played a Banshee Air Crew track at the top of the show, so it seems only fair that I play a Partly Faithful track. So here we go. I'm going to play the song Underset from their 2013 album Lazarus Under Glass. Here we go. In 
to the Cellar of Horrors on the Feel Good Station. Now, I've played a couple of tracks there, both featuring my next guest. I'm joined all the way from sunny Yorkshire by Mr. Ed Duke, also known as Mr. Ed. <laughs> the first one you heard there was a partly faithful track called Underset, 
The track you just heard was by his current project, The Insect, and the track was called Hello Hero. Ed, it's a pleasure, okay. mate. How are you doing? You, you, you forgot one of my names there. It's um, Ed Banshee as well. Oh, Ed Banshee, of fact, course. Of in course. fact, The Insect is Ed Banshee, technically. That's the, that's the name for that band. Oh, is it? Right. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realise that. No. <laughs> my I partner will be my pleased. Brother. Oh, yes. Chris Banshee, of course. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yes. Yeah, so you've been doing this quite a long while now. Because, I mean, I first became aware of your stuff for Banshee Aircrew. Uh, I think I first saw you in Birmingham in some random venue. I think it was like a ballroom or something. It was a ball. It was some kind of big event. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was something to do with the university goth sock. That's, so how long have you been doing it then? I've personally been doing it since 1989. I started Cabal and it lasted two years and largely we recorded a few things, but we never actually went live because I suffered from stage fright. So essentially right. it fizzled out and then I had a big gap in between where I was doing lots of recording, learning how to use four tracks and all that old technology, oh. but I never performed live. Um, it was only 2000, yeah, 2001, probably 2000, where I was actually able to go on stage for the first time and actually properly be in a band. And that oh, was SBA, right. Screaming Bunchy Aircraft. I was terrified. I was going to (laughs) say, how did you get over it? Was it just like a force of will kind of thing? I was forced. (laughs) Nick was, uh, at the beginning, it was mostly me and Nick working on the music at the very beginning. And um, Nick Daniel. And he um, booked the event and said, we're doing it. And I had no choice in the matter. So I had a month to learn a whole (laughs) load of Rocky Horror covers and (laughs) try to do a few of our own tracks and do it. I remember going to university and just walking up and down from university, rehearsing Rocky Horror tracks, Sweet Transvestite (laughs) on the way to work. We did, um, this is Halloween, Sweet Transvestite, and I think another another Rocky Rocky Horror show thing as well. So it wasn't a proper gig. It was an event. It was a deviation Halloween-themed fun night. Oh, excellent. That's brilliant. There's nothing, there's nothing like being chucked in at the deep end, is there? Yeah. <laughs> For getting um, over your... Uh, it's on video thing. still. Is it? There was, yeah, cool. Yeah, I've got something It was captured on VHS for all to see. It's, it's, oh, nice. I've still got it. Yeah, this is the first song, but other than that, you've got the whole thing. Oh, that's great. So your video evidence. My <laughs> first ever live performance. Yeah. Can you tell that you <laughs> sort of... <laughs> no, because I immediately found that the f- being terrified of being on stage is a fantastic gimmick because it means you um, ah. you reflect that on your audience and it, seem, you, you seem, it energizes you. Ah, Although, yeah. actually, for the first year of that band, I was so terrified that you can probably tell. I'm, I'm nervous about seeing you. You can tell I'm a bit hesitant. Because yeah. I was playing venues. We didn't do the goth scene at the beginning. We did deviations that were up night but the first year we didn't really know what goth was actually that's weird because i knew i was an old goth but i didn't realize there was a thing still going on yes yeah uh, the 90s was lost on me essentially in goth terms mm. so um yeah we did lots of venues like trillions in newcastle and weird nights in scarborough and the kind of events <laughs> where there's one man in a ferret who was shouting at you, you know, yeah. <laughs> working men's clubs yeah. up north. it was yeah. really really horrible because i was wearing mini skirts and stuff at the time as yeah. well i was definitely doing a bit of a transvestite thing so that that was amazingly confrontational to all those. I can locals. imagine. <laughs> hey, yeah. what's all this then? <laughs> and then a couple of years, we gradually discovered this thing called the goth scene in UK people gothic, and yeah. suddenly things became easier. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, which network find of yeah. clubs to play across the country, and we just ended up to- just touring the UK constantly with that band. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah you were very active with Banshee Air Crew. I noticed over the years. Yeah, there was a lovely wave of the online internet was helping in those days. You know, so after Banshee Air Crew. You went on to form Partly Faithful. How long was that around for? 2011 to 2014. So only three years. Very, very productive band because um, SBA had been going for nine years, all in all, just about. So they finished in 2010. There was a bit of a gap. And in 2011, Partly Faithful started. And we had quite a few lineup changes and released yeah. a lot of material. Did a lot of work in those years. It was a very productive band. We released our first EP almost the, almost when we did our first gig because essentially we hit the ground running big time because we started yeah. the band and Match Violet were doing their reunion and Simon asked if we could do it and we had like a month to write a whole set's worth of songs so we could perform at the March Violets gig so it was oh, very really? very really hit the ground running and, and, and Simon really helped a lot actually because that really propelled us straight back into everything because after Screaming Van Jerker, it was actually quite difficult to get running again. I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, what a, what a debut gig, you know. Oh, Cop- yeah, definitely. Yeah, big March fan Violets of the Violets. And- yeah. <laughs> Didn't Joe from um, Banshee Air Crew join up mm-hmm. with the March Violets for a while? She did. This was after... This, the, she joined up after that event. Right. I think... I, I, maybe, she, maybe she was in the March Violets at that point. She could have been, actually. I remember she was in the audience, so there's a, I suppose there's a fair chance she was playing. <laughs> um... Yeah, yes. And we, the Screen Banshee Air Crew toured, we did the March Violets, um, first reunion tour. 
largely because Tori Pink knew Ro- Rosie and, and yeah. I think one of the bands pulled out. So we we snuck in under the radar as an opening slot. Nice. And that was absolutely amazing because Match Violets are one of my touchstone bands. Yeah, the same. Two, you know, Bauhaus and Match Violets, they're my two founding bands and they're my principles of stagecraft as well, you know. Doing that gig was amazing. And um, obviously we'd had contact with Simon and kept in touch with Simon. And yeah, he said, you know, if you've got a new band together, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm interested in putting you on. So that was fantastic. But yes, Joe, he, he, I could see at that gig, at the Screw Man Jacob gig, he was watching Joe and thinking, he's got plans. And then nice. <laughs> Joe Violet, who was called that before she joined, Joe Violet. Yeah. In fact, I remember the match, Violet. So yeah. Excellent. So partly faithful, did it just fizzle out or... Blew up big time. How did it explode? Um, <laughs> I, I, I guess from the outside, it looked like it fizzled out. But mm. um, I mean, there's, there was two main iterations of Partly Fearful. Uh, the first one was with Gemma Thompson, who went on to be Savages. And that was a little lot slower, a lot more artier and a lot more serious sounding. Yeah. And, and then we we were really wrecked when she left you know, left us behind, so to speak. <laughs> I saw, I remember seeing her on the American chat shows thinking, oh, she's going a long way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and, and so but then we got Anushka in. Yep. And at first I wasn't sure about her at all, but she turned out to be a fantastic guitarist. I mean, mm. and vocalist, really fantastic creative person. She had a very <laughs> creative personality. So yeah, there was a lot of friction within the band with the different band members because Chris Brown was a fantastic bassist I mean he was a guitarist really but he played bass like guitar and I look back on his bass and I sort of think oh I didn't realise just what an asset I had at the time you know mm. at the time you, you're in it you don't yeah see you don't analyse too much do you no. yeah but when I look back on those, that especially that second lineup with Anushka and Chris originally we had Bell on drums and then with the Nushka's version, after the, we recorded our first album, Bell left and we had Matt in. And Matt was didn't know how to play our songs, but it didn't matter because he was very good at picking things up. So he played anything. He, he was like that entire punk. It's amazing. He could t- he, t- he played one gig in Leeds. He played one of the cafe and some gigs with a broken rib. <laughs> um, Ooh, nice. You know, he's that kind of guy. That yeah? kind of guy, yeah. You, you give him a dust pad, yeah. he could play it. Right. I remember him lying, li- lying up before the gig, lying down with a broken rib. And he's, anyway, yeah, he did it. Blimey. Um, that's, uh, that's some fortitude, is that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And when Anushka left, we realised we couldn't be as good as we were. So we decided to, we just finished our gigs. We did two free gigs with Steve Williams, I think. And we realised it wasn't as good, it wasn't ever going to be as good. So it's time to yeah. draw a line. Yes, that brings us neatly to your current band. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to take a short break. So I believe you've got another track of The Insect for us to play. And I believe it's yeah. a, pretty much an exclusive. Oh, it's a, certainly broadcast exclusive, yes. This Excellent. is um, going to be Mr. E- Mr. Everything and Fall in brackets, which is going to going to haunt me forever, isn't it? Having naming it like that. This is actually recorded a while back. It was recorded in early this year. So slightly, we went COVID stuff was still going on a bit. And we recorded it with um, uh, Rachel Kessler on vocals at that point. We now have a new vocalist. It's actually, this should have been released this year. It's going to be released in either December or January this year. It's our next single release, along with Inside Out Boy.
Okay, and now we're back with Ed Chuke. So, the insect, how did that sort of come about? Um, oh, it, it happened too late. I mean, in, well, <laughs> we, I, when um, when Partly Fearful finished in like 2014, it was a lot, it was like three years where I, I couldn't get anything together and I was trying really hard. So at that point, my currency was zero. So, um, yeah, the insects eventually, <laughs> the insect, yeah, we started in 2017, started originally with me and Joanna Griggs uh, meeting in a London pub. And Joanna Griggs was um, like more of a folk musician, but she was interested in trying something like this yeah. um, as bassist and vocalist. And we went up the road to um, Kevin, well, to Kevin Lord Byron, his band name is. We went up to see him after the after the official interview, and he was there with a guy called Michael Watkin, who happened to play um, guitars. So we recruited the band pretty much in that same night so that's great joe Griggs, joe Griggs was on bass and michael watkin who we met in a pub randomly and just talked to <laughs> um he he joined on guitars yeah thus the band was formed originally just with the three of us and a drum machine i guess yes that's great see i've said this for many years that all the best ideas happen in a pub <laughs> <laughs> all my band names certainly have have they <laughs> yeah i've Excellent. got three P print out i've got paper pieces of paper with scrawls all over it of band names from different bands where we've been in pubs working out what the name's going to be called and i like mm. the insect the, the name because it follows on from all, all the other bands i've done and the songs i've done so yes uh, yeah. partly faithful was the religious thing insect is a sect religion yeah. and the insect i've been singing about insects all my life for some strange Indeed. reason yeah you have so seen perfect name well i remember it wasn't there a track there was a couple of tracks about bugs on um fishnet messiah wasn't there mm -hmm. we had yeah. insect boy creepy crawlies and that's it Bearful, we had we are insect which is actually officially where this band name comes from so yeah that's just like a, a chronology <laughs> i like it i and, like it yeah so who's who's in the insect then um the current lineup um which is looking promising um uh, very promising indeed is mike watkin on guitar steve williams on bass and athena firechild who's our latest member on core vocals um, her official title is somewhat longer. It's the Dark Empress Fire Child, High Biscuit Priest Beastess, and Slayer of Uranus. She's <laughs> rather obsessed with the planet Uranus and anything to do with it. So she's certainly that is the a best breath stage of fresh air. I've and ever heard. <laughs> if you see the latest videos of her on stage, you'll kind of understand. Right. See it. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, there's me doing vocals and clowning around as usual. Yeah. So you mentioned briefly earlier that you've got a uh, the new single slash EP thing coming out. What else have you got going on? Have you got any gigs lined up? Anything like that? In terms of gigs, well, we just finished our gigs for this year, which seems like felt like a lot, but it's actually only three gigs. Right. Um, so we did um, Clan of Zymox uh, Electra Works and Leeds Lending Room with Carpin Noctum. Nice. And Luxury Stranger. Uh, in, ah, excellent. In, in, in Nottingham. And not in that order, actually. I've switched the last two around. And, um, yeah, I'm looking for gigs now, actually. I have no, not, we have no, we have no gigs lined up at the moment. So this is this month's effort is to try to get proper shows for next year. Um, we're doing some releases. So we're probably going to be booking our own gigs as well. And we're yeah. going to focus a little bit on London next year, at least the beginning, because we neglected London and we need to rebuild contact. So yeah, we're intending to do, we're going to be booking some Lon uh, London events for our April spring launch. Uh, essentially, we got we we be launching the two singles, Mister Everything and Inside Out Boy, in January. But that's going to be a soft launch. That's just going to be digital. You know, it's good in that in between in the in between period. Uh, we've got a four track EP that we're currently having. It's currently in production now, and that's probably going to be called um, Dark Places, and that's going to be released in spring. So we're going to line up some events to. To, to work with that perfect yeah. we're, we're hoping to also get some places there we're hoping to snag leads for that period as well to do some kind of launch thing as well as london so oh, yeah nice plans excellent. in the making excellent we're glad to hear it yeah let us know when you do have anything and i'll get them on the show right so yeah thanks for coming on today it's been great chatting to you as always um but before we go i've got my uh do that thing where i always ask the guests to choose basically a desert island disc so I saw a goth track that means something to them. So uh, you've gone with an absolute classic here. So uh, I'd like to introduce it, sir. Well, this is um, In the Flat Field by Bauhaus. And it's the first song that appears on, hopefully it's the right version. It's, it's the first song that appears on Press Eject and Give Me the Tip, it's the old Vic version. Mm. And, and this isn't necessarily my favourite Bauhaus song, but it's the first one I ever heard. And it pretty much changed my life. Marvellous. 
Excellent. Yep, this is the live version of In the Flat Field by Bauhaus. Station, taking you to the best shows. Tower of Babel We're trapped in the Tower of Babel 
great stuff there that was tower of babel by the screaming dead and before that you heard the live version of in the flat field by bauhaus the choice of our guest ed chuke thanks again to ed right we're heading to the end of the first hour but with <laughs> alarming speed but stay tuned for more tunes and an interview with australian author neem cohen you're listening to the cellar of horrors on the feel good station you're online at the Feel Good Station. Your first stop for feel good music, feel good chat, and much, much more. to the Cellar of Horrors on the Feel Good Station. I'm your host Tim Mendes along with Septimus the Bad Spider. This is our two. Yes, the track you just heard was this week's Improbable Cover and it was by Midnight Configuration, one of the myriad projects of Trevor Bamford who came on the show a few weeks ago. You can check that out on Mixcloud along with all previous shows. And that was Midnight Configuration's cover of Madonna's Into the Groove. Yes, so that was this week's bizarre or strange or unusual cover. We had to basically hurry through the end of the first hour because we we overran quite massively there. So, yeah, I'd just like to, again, thank Ed Chuke for coming on the show. And if any bands out there want to come on the show, all you need to do is drop me a line at cellarofhorrors at gmail.com. That's all lowercase and all one word. That's cellarofhorrors at gmail.com. Failing that, give me a shout on Facebook or wherever... Coming up in this second hour, we have another load of quality tunes. 
and an interview with Australian sapphic spec fic writer Neen Cohen. Try saying sapphic spec fic several times fast. <laughs> I haven't had a drink, honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh thanks for that yeah Septimus says maybe I'd do a better job if I had okay <sighs> no you cannot have a jetpack can you imagine he's still working on his ruddy Christmas list can you imagine spiders with jetpacks now there's a terrifying idea <laughs> no you can't have a tank come on come up with something sensible Septimus <laughs> Yeah, I know, se- I know sensible is boring, but I'm, I don't mean sensible sensible. I don't want you to get, like, socks or something. <laughs> you know what I mean. I didn't mean literally, oh, for... Will you put your Christmas list away and come and help me with the show? You've been absolutely useless all day. <laughs> right, OK. Well, I tell you what, now you're sort of vaguely paying attention. Do you want another Septimus synth selection? Go on, oh, don't, don't make me force you. Ugh, I don't know, you can't get the stuff these days. Right, what do you want then? <laughs> oh, nice. You see, even when I put you on the spot, you come up with an absolute banger. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. We'll go with Frozen Plasma and their song Tans de Revolution.
übersetzlich Analysiert und doch befremdlich Wir hatten über euch die Macht Ganz anders als von euch gedacht Konsum ein Volksamphetamin Im Wettbewerb zum Eigensinn Betrug ein Kabalist Delikt Habt ihr noch nicht genug gekriegt Uns als Zielgruppe deklariert Und auf eure Güter programmiert Verführt mit feinem Technikduft Und uns geraubt die Atemluft Doch wir wurden von euch unterschätzt Ihr habt uns lange genug gehetzt Es ist Zeit für eine Rebellion Wir tanzen die Revolution Denn wir sind jung und unangreifbar Wir sind jung und unberechenbar Wir sind jung und so schön und stark Unser Leben ein riesiger Freizeitpark Wir sind jung und promiskuitiv Leben alles aus im Kollektiv Eine beatbasierte Gradation Willkommen zum Tanze der Revolution You're online at the Feel Good Station.
Two tunes there that are guaranteed to make you want to go out clubbing, or they do me anyway, and they have done Septimus. He's off dancing in the middle of the Cellar of Horrors because he's very, very strange. Well, it keeps him out of trouble and it keeps him away from his wretched Christmas list. Uh, I don't know how I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. I really don't. Anyway, yeah, the tracks you just heard. The first one you heard was Tam's Revolution by Frozen Plasma from 2009, and it was an EP. And the second one you heard was a Wax Trax classic. I will do a Wax Trax special at some point. But that was a Wax Trax classic from the band Psycho Sonic. The track was Silicon Jesus, and it was the 12-inch mix, which can be found, obviously, in the old 12-inch vinyl, which I've got, and uh, also in the Wax Trax Black Box, which was a compilation from the mid-'90s, which collected a lot of Wax Trax rarities and classics and different mixes and you know lost gems it was a really good compilation it's like three cd four cd something like that but it was really good really good compilation if you could track a copy down i'd recommend you do so okay we're gonna move on i'm gonna play you a track now by play dead because uh i did my release the bats dj night the other week um i do it every every month at the end of the month except december i won't be doing one on the end of december because i will be hibernating but January, the end of January, I'll be back and it'll be last Saturday of every month from then on. But anyway, uh, my friend Steve-O turned up bearing gifts. Uh, and I think I've mentioned before that this Steve-O happens to be Steve Green, who was in the 80s post-punk goth band Play Dead. And uh, he, what he had was a, uh, a brand shiny new vinyl for me. Uh, it's, uh, it was come out, it was released on the 5th of December, I believe. And it's uh, Play Dead, the collection. It's a collection of their singles, basically. It's like a best of. And it was on blue vinyl. So (laughs) I was very, very excited, as you would imagine. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play you a classic Play Dead track. This is Sacrosanct.
Feelgood Station, taking you to the best shows. I don't know how we got here. I don't know where to go. I'm weighing up my options. I guess I'll never know I'll show you every weakness I'll show you every flaw Just promise you won't leave here Just promise there is more is glass My heart is glass My heart is glass I know the days still pass and the world still spins round I know the rain won't last And the sun still goes down But my heart is glass And it's tumbling to the ground Without you It breaks My heart is glass listening to the Cellar of Horrors on the Feel Good Station the track you just heard there was the brand shiny new single from Orca called My Heart is Glass that released last month and it's available for the princely sum of 79p on Bandcamp so go and grab yourself a copy before that you heard an absolute classic from 1985 by Play Dead that was Sacrosanct from their album The Company of Justice and it's also available on their brand new compilation The Collection which is available in blue vinyl and CD. Right, we'd better get ready for our second guest of the evening, Neen Cohen, all the way from Down Under. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to play another tune and then we'll get Neen in. Okay, 
So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to play the 12 inch mix of an absolute classic by the March Violets, a band we mentioned several times during my interview with Ed Duke. This is Snake Dance, the extended mix. Thank you. 
One of my personal favourites there, that is Snake Dance, the extended mix by the March Violets. Now it's just about... Ooh, what, hang, on, hang on, what do you want, Septimus? <coughs> oh no, not another idea. What's your idea? <coughs> yeah, there's lots of bands named after March Violet songs. Okay, yeah, that's actually a good idea. Yeah, we'll do that. So then <laughs> for the rest of the evening, the songs that we'll play will be by bands who have taken their names from March Violet songs. Okay, it's about time for Neen Cohen. So off your pop, you. There's no point in you hanging around. You're not going to be able to freak her out. She's from Australia. They're used to big old spiders out there. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, you go and work on your Christmas list. Ah, right, okay, it's time. We are joined now by my second guest of the evening, all the way from Down Under. We are joined by Australian author Neen Cohen. Neen, it's a pleasure as always. How are you doing? Good, Tim. How are you? Thanks so much for having me on. So how are things down there at the minute? Well, it, it's warm. It's hot. So we're, you know, the other end of the world spectrum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> We've been good. There's a lot of um, craziness going around with coming up to Christmas and all that kind of jazz, but oh, yeah. life is good. As soon as Halloween ends, it all goes insane and tinsel ends up everywhere, doesn't it? It's like... It, it, I know, it's crazy, isn't it? So, yeah, how long have you been writing now, then? Um, well, I've always written. So many of us authors, we always yeah. write and, you know, keep it stashed in our drawers. Or But it would be almost five years now that I finally went, you know what? I haven't written for a while. I went and had a child instead um, and got overwhelmed with just being a, a new mum yeah. and didn't write for a while. And what often happens with a lot of parents, you know, they lose themselves to being a parent. And I was walking past the local shops one day and there was a group sitting there who had a sign up saying writers group. And I went, oh, okay. And I went up and asked and they said, yep, just find us on Facebook. So I did that. And then I started going and in my head, I was still like, oh yeah, you know, the imposter syndrome came up. Oh, and I was like, <laughs> I, you know, I'm a I'm a fake. I, I, I'm a faker. You know, I have that Queen song. Yes, I'm the great pretender. Going through my head <laughs> every time. Every time I thought about it, but with the motivation and the support, I finally got up there. I, I got some travels published, and then slowly got short stories. And in 2020, I co-wrote a poetry book with a mate because I was saying how I don't know if I'll ever be brave enough to put something out there that has my name on the front cover. Right. And so yep. she went, okay, well, we'll do it together. And we did that. Ah. And since then, I kind of get a buzz out of seeing my name on the front cover. Yeah, it's a strange feeling, isn't it? The first time it happens is like, I mean, I've always suffered with imposter syndrome. And um, the first time I actually had something with my name on the front of it. It was always like it was unreal. <laughs> it's just like, it's you so know. It's surreal. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's really it strange. Is, it is. So weird when you look up at your bookshelf and you've got like all this stuff you read and then your name next to it all. <laughs> it's really bizarre. It is, but it's it's like, it's so surreal. But then at the same time, it's this total tingle of like, oh my God, look at that. Yeah. It's nice validation a little bit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now you see, you tend to write a wide variety of things. You're not like, not like myself, who's pretty much a one trick pony. You, <laughs> you, I mean, because you've appeared in horror things with myself and you also do fantasy stuff and like that so yeah i mean what what are your sort of your main areas um i feel like i'm finally finding my voice on that i consider myself like all of my you know bios and stuff i'm a sapphic speculative fiction author yep. so i focus a lot on having diverse main characters female sapphic in some way if you don't know what sapphic is it's lesbian bisexual um transgender female it's sapphic female loving female it comes from the original poet sappho yeah so yes yeah, so i love that but i definitely um speculative fiction i have tried so hard <laughs> to write romance and <laughs> you know i really do try and there's always a romantic thread but oh, i can't do it, it. Up not <laughs> <laughs> I can't so, do it. <laughs> I know. For November, for NaNoWriMo, my plan was to write my very first just contemporary romance. So I started with the, the title, just working title, Coffee and Cars, right? 
Yep. Ten minutes into the first of November, it turned into a coffee <laughs> cars and necromancy. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> so I, I definitely love it. And I would ideally love to try like multiple genres in the yeah. speculative fiction because I find something beautiful and just addictive in all of them. I do tend to go toward urban. Mm-hmm. So urban fantasy, urban dark fantasy. I love steampunk, but I've, I'm not really good at writing it yet, but I'm getting there and I'm learning it. And that's the best thing about being able to kind of put yourself under a wider umbrella yeah. is that I'm learning new things about different genres all the time. Um, like you said, I've done horror and I loved loved doing that. I loved mm. working on that project with Yo. I would really like to try some sci-fi in the future. Ah, yeah. yeah. I've and strayed into been- sci-fi. I think as I've strayed into different genres, but yeah. they, but they've always but they're always cosmic horror. So I've done like yeah. steampunk with cosmic horror or like sci-fi with cos yeah mashups. Yeah. I, I kind the mash-ups of mashups are the yeah. best though. They just yeah. because they put different twists on it, and it just makes it something fresh and fun. Yeah, in- so- yeah, exactly. I also love really corrupting ideas. Yes. <laughs> I, yes. I've always one of my things is pulling the rug out on readers. They think they're reading something, and then a tentacle appears. You know <laughs> what the yeah. hell just happened? I love, I love exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, lo- I I love that kind of just messing with the tropes and the themes yeah. of things, and just seeing what I could do. What if I just threw something else in there? Yeah, exactly. So absolutely right. Yeah, we're just going to take a very short break now. Going with Septimus' idea to play songs by bands who have taken their names from March Violet songs, let's go with Children on Stun with Sidelined.
Children on Stun with Signed Lined from the anniversary edition of their classic album Tourniquets of Love's Desire. Okay, we're back with me and Cohen. Yeah, so you, you mentioned earlier Dark Fantasy. Now, your no, your novels that have come out, no, the, the novels or novellas? I can't, I can't Novellas. Yeah. He's yeah working on, line, I'm working on it? the novel. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. I mean, mine are sort of, because I can't do, well, I can't keep to word counts. <laughs> uh, so mine kind of stray. Uh, so I don't know what I'd call half of them, whether they are actually novellas or short novels or, or whatever. But anyway, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so so they're dark fantasy. So tell us a little bit about those, because I believe you've got a new one just released at the end of last month. I do, absolutely. So, yes, my debut novella came out May last year, so May 2021. It is called Cold as Hell. It is set in small country town in Queensland, Australia, because there are not enough speculative fiction set in Australia. Yeah. And Australia has some big spaces where stuff could be happening that no one knows, and I love that. I think we've spoken about this before because I mentioned I like the only one I can think of, like um, because cosmic horror. Uh, obviously, you've, you've got a Lovecraft story based out in there, over there, uh, yeah. Shadow Out of Time. But David Conyers, who's uh, an Australian author, has done a whole mythos set in Australia, yeah. and it's but and I love it because it is so unusual because it's it's usually in New England, isn't it? You know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and there's just not a lot of fantasy or. Mm. You know, that speculative fiction in Australia. And I'm like, why the hell not? I want to see books that I can relate to. I can see the spaces. I can see the places. I've been there. So it's set in um, a small town called Open Fields. And Open Fields is different because it has magic. So the whole town has magic. They are basically a cult that is run by a prophet of sorts who divvies out who gets the magic and who gets to use the magic. Ah. And we actually see it from Addie's point of view, the main character, and she is basically shunned by the entire town. She is an outcast, but the magic is an addiction. So once you have a taste, you, you want another hit. So she stays there despite being this complete outcast because... That's where the magic is. I love it. Look, it's a great concept. <laughs> so you've basically got like a magical Charlie Manson divvying out the power to people. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. It's a great concept. Yeah, so you've got a follow-up to that that literally came out a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. All right. So this is the sequel to Cold as Hell. It's called Black as Day, and it follows on from Addie finally leaving open field. Sorry, bit of a spoiler, but um, <laughs> I won't tell you how she leaves or how what happens, but she does meet someone while she's in open fields and they leave together. And it's following them on from this. Addie has discovered a lot during Cold as Hell and she's having to deal with that. We're also seeing the perspective because Cold as Hell is all first person, we only get it from Addie's point of view. Right. Black as Day is actually from Addie's point of view the other character who she leaves town with, and then we actually get introduced to a third character. Ah. Um, and we get her point of view as well. And she is Zand. And I've had a few um, ARC readers have already come back to me and said how much they love Zand, which is great because I adore her. I've had a few people ask if I will be writing more of Zand's story, but at the moment I think the story's good as where it's ended at the moment. Nice. Um, but I am really excited about it coming out. It's a little bit longer than Cold as Hell. I'm so proud of it, and I think it's fantastic, and I really hope everyone who reads it enjoys it as much as I have. Oh, excellent. Um, one thing I love is when people sort of latch onto a character, especially if it's kind of a secondary character, because, I mean, I am similar with my character Ivy Finch, who's this batty old lady, yes. um, <laughs> which I know you you liked, and people are like, oh, we need another one. I so, right, okay, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to have to write an you Ivy Finch story at some point <laughs> it's uh yeah it's nice when things sort of grow their own legs isn't it in a, in a way it really is they decide like anyone who who thinks that authors control the worlds they create absolutely not yeah absolutely the characters yeah. decide it they decide hey I'm getting my own story. Yeah, yeah, precisely. It's like, yeah, it's like the amount of times I've had a character just crop up in a story and they're only supposed to be for like one scene or something and they end up <laughs> taking over the rest of the book. 
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a great feeling when things like that. So yeah, so Cold as Hell is available now, as is its follow up, Black as Day. Right. So yeah, Neen, and thank you for coming on today. For having me, Tim. It's been fantastic. Continuing our dive into Septimus's March Violet's rabbit hole, let's have a p- song by Snake Dance, shall we? This one is called Fall from Grace. Listening to the Cellar of Horrors on the Feel Good Station, an absolutely brilliant little known track there. That was Snake Dance with Fall from Grace, taken from their 2011 EP Winterland. Yeah, they a short lived band, but really good. And obviously, they took their name from a Marge Violets track, you know? <laughs> and uh, we've got another one with a Marge Violets inspired name just before we go off air, because yeah, that's pretty much all we got time for this week. Thank you as ever for tuning in and. Uh, Thank you again to our guests, Ed Chuke and Neen Cohen. 
And if you want to come on the show, get in contact with me at sellerofhorrors at gmail.com. That's all lowercase or one word, sellerofhorrors at gmail.com. Or shoot me a line on Facebook Messenger or something like that. You know, just wave a tentacle in some way, shape or form. Righty-ho, we're going to play this show out with a track by Grooving in Green from their 2019 EP Warning Signs. This is a redux version of Premonition, which was one of their early tracks. There's a re-recorded version, and it's absolutely superb. So yeah, get yourself on Bandcamp and grab a copy of the EP. So right, it's uh, it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from the dastardly spider. So yeah, we'll see you next week. Same time, same place, on the Feel Good Station. Good night.